All right, guys, so I know one of the most challenging things in all of sim racing can be to actually get your missus to approve purchasing a sim rig in the first place. So we've got something pretty special for you today. We've actually got all three of the Coffee Racer products, but this is the Coffee Racer Living. We're gonna be checking it out today, but I thought the ultimate test of this thing would be to set it up in the living room. My wife, Jill, actually knows nothing about this at the moment. I've literally just brought it upstairs a second ago. So we're gonna put it to the ultimate test. We're gonna see what she thinks of it as an intro to this review, a legitimate first test. Now I've uh, I've put my wedding album on top there to uh, try and soften the blow a little bit, try warm her up a bit, but let's see, let's see how she reacts. Hey Jill, you got a second? Can you come here? Say hi. Hi. <laughs> what do you think of the, uh, what do you think of the coffee table? I like yeah. that. It matches. Matches matches everything pretty well, That's doesn't it? It's a really nice. Ooh, I like. Oh, it's got a herringbone. Okay. You that she just she just picks up the wedding album and takes it away immediately. No, look at that. It's herringbone. I love that design. I was talking about herringbone the other day with relation to carbon fiber car parts, but oh, okay. it works in relation to this too. But you want to know something really cool about it? Um take off the uh, take off the album. Yes. Oh, look how young we were. <laughs> I know. Take off the take off the thing there, the plant, flower, the flower, whatever you want to call flower. it. Flower, yep. calla lilies, our wedding flower, by the way. Oh, was it? Yes, that's what we call. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> and all right, so now I want you to grab the um, grab the the wooden bit and just lift it up. It'll come off. Look inside. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's clever. So it's uh, it, it's a it's a rig. Yeah. So it folds out, and uh, you can pull it up to the couch, use it as a... Uh... How heavy is it? Oh, that's not it bad. slides all right on the carpet. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Yeah. What do you think? Is that, and uh... then you can pack it away. Well, that's the thing. You can pack it away, but it's like when it's, it's packed... Pretty. When it's packed away, yeah. it's not like in the corner of the room somewhere taking up space or anything. That is... And it's a solid coffee table. Wife approved? I approve. Awesome. All right, let's get into the review, huh? pretty cool okay guys so today we're going to be checking out all three of the current sim racing rig offerings from coffee racer now if you're not familiar with coffee racer as you saw in the intro they are a company that does something pretty unique they make these fold away cockpits that uh, rather than having to be tucked away in a closet somewhere when not in use or you know kind of looking ugly in the corner of a room these actually fold away into a nicely concealed little unit and as you've seen in the intro you can either use them as something like a coffee table or a plant stand like what we have here all kinds of different ways that you can integrate them into your daily life without them necessarily getting in the way and getting you in trouble with the missus which I think is going to be a really big kind of uh, selling point of these particular rigs so what I'm going to be doing today is taking you through the experience of what it's actually like to live with one of these cockpits we've been testing them out for a number of weeks now just putting them through normal kind of usage scenarios so folding them away trying to move them around the room folding them back out again and seeing what they're actually like to live with so that's what we're going to be covering in today's video before we get into it firstly i do need to say a big thank you to coffee racer for sending across this gear for us to check out now we're not really going to be making any direct comparisons in today's video simply because there aren't really any other products on the market that are like this but we will be talking a little bit about uh, some other types of cockpits and you know where their strengths and weaknesses may lay uh, compared to something like this, whether this is something that's going to be more practical for you, or whether you're better off going with something else. So it's important that you understand all the equipment that we'll be talking about has all been sent to us under the exact same conditions. Now, we don't have any affiliate links for Coffee Racer specifically at the time that we're making this video, but if that situation does change, we will put some affiliate links down in the description box below. So if you do find what we do here at Boosted Media useful and you want to help support us, that is an awesome way of doing so at no additional cost to you. But let's start off by talking about some pricing information here. Now, the first thing I want you guys to understand, uh, obviously these are very, very heavy. Uh, they come packaged uh, in some scenarios, pre-assembled uh, pre in some scenarios as a DIY. And we'll take you through the process of building one of these a little bit later on today as well. Uh, but if you're in the European Union, so most countries within the EU, uh, free shipping. Now, obviously you'll need to factor in uh, whatever relevant uh, import duties and taxes on top of the pricing that I'm about to give you. Uh, if you're in the US, they are just about to start, or they may have even already started started by the time you guys are seeing this video, some uh, local US distribution as well. So check their website for the full details on that. 
that should hopefully save you quite a bit of money if you're in the US over having one shipped across from, uh, from Europe. So definitely something to check out if you're interested in one of these in the US. So firstly, we have the Coffee Racer Go, which is the more entry level of the three models. Now this guy comes in at 412.40 euro. It does come as a build it yourself kit, relatively easy to build as you'll see later on in today's video. We have either the option of a wooden top or metal top with this guy. And you can also order it either with caster wheels like what you see on the play over here, or uh, with little rubber feet like what we have installed on this guy. The rubber feet have the advantage of being able to wind in and out of the little metal inserts on the bottom. So that can account for an uneven floor if that is a problem in your house. So this guy is constructed of a mix of aluminium and steel, and they use thinner steel on this particular model than what you'll find on the other two, which does make it quite a bit lighter, but not quite as sturdy as the others. So you're looking at 27 kilograms unloaded, so without any sim racing hardware mounted in this. So not too heavy that it's impossible to move around on your own, particularly if you have wheels, but still not something that you're gonna be wanting to carry up and down stairs every single day when you wanna race. So that's one thing to consider as well. But this guy is uh, rated for up to an eight Newton meter wheelbase. We've got the GTDD Pro with the boost kit installed. So that is an eight Newton meter wheelbase that we've been testing the rig with and uh, 50 kilogram load cell brake pedal as well. So that will obviously depend on what you're actually sitting in to drive. As you'll see a little bit later on, we do have a special bracket installed on this particular chair and we'll take you through how all that works. Uh, but yeah, you will need to just uh, make sure that you have a sturdy way of fixing your chair to the uh, to the rig so you're not sliding back every time you push down on the brake pedal, even with a 50 kilogram load cell. So just be aware of that. And the dimensions of this guy are 75 by 48 by 45.3 centimeters when it's all folded down. So that is a quick rundown on the go. We then move across to the play model, which is quite a lot more sturdy than what we have with the go, but also quite a lot more expensive. So the price for this guy is uh, 577.69 euro at the time that we're making the video. Now, if you're in Europe, this comes as a build it yourself kit. Then if you're ordering in the US, it does come pre-assembled and the version that we got was actually the pre-assembled version. Now, I'm not sure with the distribution being set up in the US, whether that's gonna remain the case. So that's one thing to just check if you are ordering one of these from a distributor, whether you're gonna have to build it yourself or whether it comes pre-assembled. But like I said, it's not a major deal to actually build the cockpit itself. It's actually mounting the hardware into the cockpit that is more tricky than actually putting the cockpit together, but we'll cover that later on for you guys as well. So the play model, uh, that uh, weighs quite a lot more than the Go does, simply because it is constructed primarily of steel rather than a mix of steel and aluminium. And as you'll see later on, the material is quite a lot thicker in this guy as well. So this guy is 45 kilograms unloaded. So not something that you're gonna be moving around on your own uh, unless you have wheels on it. One thing to consider there for sure. Uh, this is rated for up to a 20 Newton meter base. We tested it with a uh, Club Sport DD Plus, so 15 Newton meters of holding torque, and it's rated for up to 150 kilogram load cell. But again, as we mentioned with the Go, that is gonna purely depend on how you've got your chair fixed to the rig so that it's, uh, so that it doesn't slide back every time you push down on the brake pedal. So again, you will need to account for that. Dimensions here, 76 by 48 by 42 centimeters. So very similar to what we have with the Go. And this guy is available in black, as you see here, or white, like what you see on the other guys. More of an industrial style kind of design with this guy. So there isn't actually a wooden top option available for the play model. We then move across to the Coffee Racer Living, which at the moment is in the uh, the plant stand configuration. So it's cool that they've got a couple of different configuration options available for this. So you are looking at, for the living version, the price is pretty darn steep for this model. It's 975.21 euro. Uh, again, do remember that it does come with free shipping if you're in Europe. I'm not sure what the arrangement will be with US distribution in terms of shipping cost, but it is definitely very expensive. The quality I think does match the price. Whether or not it's worth it to you, that's something that you guys will just have to decide based on all the things that we're gonna cover in today's video. So this one does come pre-assembled as well, and it weighs in at 34 kilograms. So a little bit less heavy than what we have with the play model. You can move it around, you can kind of slide it around on the floor by yourself. Now because of the design of this guy and the fact they're trying to keep all the surfaces looking nice and clean, so you can either stand it up as a plant stand or lay it flat 
as a, uh, as a coffee table. They do give you some little magnetic uh, carpet pads and rubber pads for you know keeping it safe off the ground, just so you don't risk scratching it all up. So if you are on tiles or floorboards or a hard surface like that, probably not something you're gonna wanna move around on your own. If you're on carpet, you may be able to just kind of slide it into position. So 34 kilograms unloaded, and this guy's rated for up to a 12 Newton meter wheelbase. We tested this guy with the Logitech G Pro, as you'll see later on, and uh, up to 60 to 100 kilogram load cell pedals. So this guy is probably more suited to to a living room style arrangement where you might be wanting to drive it on a couch or something like that. So we'll talk later on about what that experience is actually like using a heavy load cell brake sitting on a couch because I think that's something that is gonna be very important to consider. And for those who might be wondering, the dimensions here, you're looking at 74 by 48 by 42 centimeters. So in terms of options for the living version, you've got the choice of white like what you see here or black like what you see on the play. Uh, you can also choose between the uh, types of wood that you want for either the plant stand or the uh, coffee table as well. So you can choose between oak or walnut for those. Uh, oak is what you see here. Walnut is a darker wood. And then as we mentioned, you can choose whether you want to have the plant stand or the uh, or the coffee table configuration. So there are a couple of accessories available as well. There is the desk chair mount as we'll be looking at later on and we mentioned earlier. That comes in at 94.21 euro. So pretty expensive for what it is. And unfortunately it is going to be a necessary purchase unless you can come up with some sort of fancy way to fabricate something yourself. But if you're running heavier load cell pedals, you're definitely going to want to have your chair fixed to the rig so you don't slide back every time you touch the brake because that's just going to completely ruin muscle memory, which uh, of course has the knock-on effect of completely ruining your uh, consistency and your lap time. So definitely an important consideration there. They do also sell a couple of other accessories, which unfortunately they didn't send to us, so we can't really comment on them. There's a shifter and handbrake mount, which looks pretty elaborate on their website. It looks like it should be pretty sturdy, but again, we can't really comment on it. There's also a DD front mount, which is designed for the likes of say a SimiCube base, for example. Uh, that comes in at 81. 182 euro and there's also a DD side mount available for Fnatic bases. Uh, not that you actually really need it I don't think. I don't know whether it's going to be more sturdy or not because obviously we don't have it here to test but the, uh, all three of these rigs do have Fanatec hole patterns drilled directly into their wheel plates. So you don't necessarily need to have that side mount, but if you do option for that, you're looking at 65, 29 euros. I mean, those prices just seem a little bit disproportionately expensive compared to the price of the cockpit. I mean, you're looking at, what did I say? 412 euro for this entire thing. And then 81, 82 for just the front mount for a semi cube like that just, seems really expensive. You guys can judge for yourselves, but that was just one thing that kind of jumped out at me. So let's quickly now run you through the process of actually getting one of these from its packed away state, like what you see here in front of me now, to its ready to race state. Now the process is pretty much the same across all three models. It's just a couple of little details which we'll talk about when we get into the intricacies of each one of the three models. But all we need to do is just remove the top. These aren't fixed on any of the three models, so they just lift off and you can place them aside. Obviously, you just make sure you're not scratching them up and putting them on top of any surface that's going to damage them. Then what we need to do is make sure that our four bolts or cantilevers, I guess you could call them, are released. And then we're going to grab the base and lift it up. Now on the play model, as you see here, this is quite heavy. So you're just going to need to be really careful that you don't drop it. Now the reason that's important is that there's no kind of damper system or anything that's going to catch it for you if you drop it. It's literally just gonna fall down and the first thing that's gonna happen is the back of the base is gonna smack into the pedals. So this really isn't something that uh, that children should be doing. Uh, if you are looking at buying one of these for, you know, even up to I'd say maybe like 14 years of age, you're probably gonna be wanting to pack it up and down for your kids rather than trusting them to do it themselves. So what we're gonna do then is lift this up into whichever position you need it in. You can see there's a bunch of positions down the side here, which you can kind of slot into. And then you get a little bit of adjustment forward and back in terms of angle, depending on which hole you put it in. So if you put it in the top hole, like what I kind of need to have it on, and you can see it's a little bit fidgety to kind of get in position because it always wants to go into those grooves. So we'll lock it in the, we'll lock it in the top position here. I think we're close to the top. No, we're not close to the top. Hang on. So you can see it's pretty, it's pretty fidgety. We're getting that top position. You do get the knack of it over time, but occasionally it just gets a little bit jammed up and doesn't quite want to go where you want it. So once it's kind of locked into, you get a better look down here now if you see the uh, individual slots that it can kind of go into, which stops it from falling backwards. So in that top slot, which is where I need it, there's a little bit of adjustment forward and back. Once you've got it in the position you want, you just lock off these little ratchet bolts like so. and then 
lock off these cantilevers. Now just quickly before we move down to the pedals, you'll also notice that I have the uh, connections for my wheelbase all unplugged here. Now there's a very good reason for that. You guys have probably already guessed it. I'll plug these in now, but you can imagine if I packed this down with those connections plugged in, all of the weight of this entire thing is all gonna be resting on those connections if I lay it down flat against those pedals. And as you guys would know, if you've watched our uh, CSDD and DD Plus videos, as well as our GTDD Pro and CSLDD videos, these connections on the back of these Fanatec bases aren't particularly strong. I mean, no wheelbase is gonna survive having its entire weight rested on those connections. It's just not designed to do that. But we do see a lot of cases of these connections snapping off the back of the PCBs on the uh, CSLDD and GTDD Pro. So definitely 100% you're gonna to wanna to unplug whatever wheelbase you have. It's not really a complaint about the Fanatec bases. Nothing's gonna survive having the weight of this resting on its, uh, on its connections. So let's move down to the pedals now. These are a little bit more fiddly. So you need to release these levers again. And this is where you can see to get the tension right, it kind of has to be in the right position, but because you can't have it pointing down, you can't really, you know, you're limited in where you can angle it. It does get a little bit fiddly and cumbersome to, uh, to get things mounted, but we're gonna release these guys too. We get our power supply out. We'll talk about that in just a minute as well. And then we're going to lift the pedals up into the position that we want them. So again, you can see there's positions on the back here to adjust our pedal angle. So quite a, quite a good amount of adjustment there. I actually need for these particular pedals because of the angle that they're fixed at, they need to kind of sit back. But you can see here what happens is this can slide forward all the way to here and back pretty much as far as it will go. Now it's limited by the pedals that we've got mounted here. We'll talk about mounting for the pedals a little bit later on because that is something that was quite fiddly. But plenty of adjustment there I would say for most people given that your seat is always gonna be in a fixed position pretty much relative to the back of the rig. So you're not gonna really need to push the pedals further away or closer than what we have in terms of adjustment here. But these are pretty fidgety to get mounted because what you gotta do is you gotta kind of push this guy into the back here, lock it off into position, but then you kind of can't get your hand in to get the ratchet down. So again, depending on the pedals that you have will determine how tricky this is to do, but you can kind of see how I'm struggling to get that locked into position. And then you've got to do the same thing on the other side as well. And then once you've done that, you can lock these off as well. Now you may find that you're lucky and you're able to fold your wheelbase away without having the need to move the pedals. In my particular case, with the position that I need my pedals for driving, they do interfere with the base and it doesn't fold away far enough to clear the top of the rig. So in my particular case, I do need to put those pedals flat to the ground every single time I wanna pack this away, which is a bit of a pain, but it may not be the case for everybody. So that's the procedure for getting up and driving across all three of these cockpits, provided that you don't have a seat that is actually fixed to the cockpit. If you're wanting to use their seat bracket, which we referenced earlier, now this guy is only compatible with seats that have a standard 19.5 by 20 hole pattern underneath. So in this particular case, they actually sent us one of these Noble chairs as an example, which has actually been really good. I've been using this as my office chair for about four months now, and I've actually been really impressed with it. Also compatible with Secret Lab chairs as well, they did tell me, but there's a full compatibility list on their website, I believe. So if we flip this guy up quickly, just so you can have a look underneath here, very simple, and we'll overlay some footage of actually assembling this as we go. But it basically just sandwiches between the seat and the base plate here and allows adjustment in and out. So you can see it's got a bunch of holes here that allow you to move the bracket in or out depending on your distance that you need to sit back from the rig. So what we're gonna actually do is wind this out for now. So all we need to do is just loosen off the four ratchets. The whole thing then slides forward. For me, I actually need it in the furthest forward position. We then screw it down again. And then we'll flip the seat back up onto its wheels. And all you need to do, it's a little bit uh, more cumbersome in practice than it maybe looks on camera, but you need to get the seat at roughly the right height. And then we wanna loosen these guys off as well. And you do have to assemble all this, but it's got this felt pad in here. It's almost like a carpet material that protects it from scratching everything up and then you wanna put a little bit of weight on the seat to kind of push it down into position like so. And then it comes with this knob, which then winds in into the thread on the wheelbase. Now you do have to be pretty careful with this. It does cross thread 
very, very easily. So just be very careful. I'm a little concerned about the longevity of these, to be honest with you. I feel like over time, the thread on these is probably going to wear down and or the uh, metal down here is going to fatigue. Now on the, on the play model, it is pretty sturdy. They do also include a little tab on the go model if you come over this side. But look, this is pretty flimsy. I, I mean, when we were driving with it, it was moving around a lot. And uh, I, I don't think this is going to stand the test of time. I think this is going to fatigue and crack and uh, just break off over time. So yeah, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that one. But yeah, for me, I wasn't particularly happy with this design in relation to the Go model, but on the Play model, it actually did work really well. So let me actually just, I'll, I'll, I'll sit in this and just sort of show you how it works quickly. So we get that screwed on and then you can see now it's quite difficult to actually get into the rig. So you've got to kind of step over, get into your chair, get your legs into the rig like so. And then everything kind of just sort of ties in together. So if I try to, uh, drop my seat down now, you can see because it's fixed in the front, it actually kind of forces it to recline, which works quite well again in the play model. But on the, uh, on the go model, when you tried to drop the seat down, all it was doing is just kind of bending the metal in the front of the rig. So it didn't work anywhere near as well on that as it does here. But you can see once I get my seat adjusted down to the correct height and everything's kind of reclined, my feet line up with the pedals quite nicely here. And I'll quickly pop a wheel onto the base as well for you guys so you can see. Now remember again, this was in its uh, maximum adjusted position in terms of height. So it's not too bad. The, the wheel deck does sit a little bit low for me. I'm six foot tall exactly. And look, ideally for me, I would have this maybe the top of the wheel sitting about here. You kind of want to have your hand resting about there. Distance wise, it's okay. You want to have the wheel here on your wrist, but height wise, it is a little bit low, even at its maximum position. Now in terms of adjustment, Again, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but let me show you in a more practical sense now that we've got everything set up. That is the range of movement that I have or adjustment in that, uh, in that maximum upright position. If I drop it down a little bit and you can see again, it's quite heavy to do so, but we'll get it slotted into one of these other positions. Again, like in the lower positions, you can bring it forward even more than you could in the other ones, but you still can't push it back any further, but again, I need it in that top position to get the height that I need for the cockpit. So let's try to get it up again. There we go. That's in the top position. So yeah, it, look, it, it is quite easy to get yourself in a situation where you're holding it and you can support the weight. And then, you know, you just can't get it to jump into the groove that you want it to. And then you kind of get stuck and it's getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And you're like, oh, so, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I, I don't really, I can't complain about it too much because like I can't really see how they could improve the design overall. I mean, it, it, it's, it's always going to be a balance between rigidity and adjustability, but some sort of a damper system or something that just sort of helps you to support the weight so that you're not, um, you're not having to carry the entire weight while you're adjusting it would not only make it easier, but also make it a lot safer to be making adjustments too. I think that's probably my main concern is that the risk of dropping this and either injuring yourself or damaging your wheelbase is not necessarily large, but definitely a consideration, I would say. But that's all locked into position now. And again, I'm six foot tall and I have no problem driving with this. I just wouldn't say that it's my optimum driving position with this particular chair, which is one of the chairs that they suggest mounted here. So that's the experience ergonomically, at least with the play. We'll get into the actual driving experience, flex and all those things later on in today's video. But I want to move over to the Go now and show you what the differences are between the play and the Go before we get into the process of actually packing one of these down. So we'll do the exact same thing with the Go now and you can see the differences. So we'll get the bracket lined up here and you can see straight away, this was the height that we had uh, for, the, for the previous rig. So we can actually drop this down on the support here. So what I'll do is I'll quickly do that. So that's in that bottom position. We'll line it up and get that screw lined up with the thread. There we go. And you can see on this particular model, the screw is very, very long compared to on the, uh, on the play. So it's just a difference in the design, but it means you have to wind this in for about eight years. <laughs> All right, I'll leave it at that for now. I don't want to put too much tension on it. So let me try and maneuver myself into the rig here. <laughs> Get my legs 
in position. And again, you have to be really, because the edges of this are not sharp, but you know, they're not padded either. So you've got to be really careful getting in and out that you don't bash your shin and take a chunk out of your shin. So now I'm in position and you can see, again, this is the chair that they recommended. This is in the maximum, you know, height adjustment position. It's just way, 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 way too low. So if I drop the chair down, I can recline it a bit, but it doesn't, it doesn't really tilt back to the extent that it did in the, uh, in the play model, just because of the height of this. Now we do have the, we do have the feet on this particular model rather than the wheels. If we had the wheels on it, it would raise it up a little bit and it would make this a little bit better, but I'll probably only bring the wheel up to about here, for example. So it's just still a little bit low for me. So these again, like it's, it's not necessarily a, co a complaint about the go, but it's, it's important that you guys are aware of the differences between the two here and how, you know, I feel, I feel like the go is more suitable for a separate chair that, uh, you know, maybe a couch or something like that, that sits lower. Whereas the play seems to be more for like an office environment or like a, you know, a home studio environment where you want to be able to wheel it away and move it up to a desk and maybe use it in that manner. So again, perfectly drivable, but just ergonomically, there's a few more compromises here than what we had with the play model. Now, in terms of angle adjustment here, all pretty much exactly the same. One other adjustment that I should mention here too, uh, which is the case on all three models, is that you can loosen off these knobs, top and bottom, and that actually allows you to slide the base forward and backwards like so as well. So I would actually wanna have that slid forward like that. And I actually do really like this design. I like how they've made it so that you can uh, move it back and forth nice and easily. And it does lock into position quite nicely as well. So I've never had a scenario where I, uh, where I found that it was loose and it was sliding forward and back. So just, just that little bit too, well, I wouldn't say a little bit, it's, it's a lot too low for me. Really the wheel should be about there. But with this particular chair, again, that they recommended, I just can't get the seating position low enough to really be compatible with this rig. So it is what it is. Let's move on now and talk about the uh, process of packing these guys down. Then once we've done that, I wanna talk you through the process of mounting the hardware to the rigs, then we'll get into the driving experience. Okay, so firstly, we're going to remove the bolt from the chair to detach that. So we'll wind that all the way out. And as I said, on the Go model, it's, uh, it's really, really long. On the Play model, because the bracket sits lower, it uh, isn't such a pain, but on this, it is a bit of a pain to do. There we go. And then we can uh, raise the chair up again. Oh, the thing for this one thing with this chair, these, these end bits seem to constantly, I actually find the chair really comfortable, but these end bits are constantly falling off on me. Let's uh, raise that up again. There we go. And then what we can do is we can uh, lock this off like that so that it's kind of tucked out of the way and then loosen off the four ratchets underneath. And what that does is it allows us to kind of tuck this whole bit away so it sits underneath nicely like that and it's not gonna bash into your legs while you're just sitting in a chair using it for normal office use. So actually, I really like the design of this, uh, of this seat bracket overall. I just don't feel like it works particularly well with the, uh, with the Go model for the reasons previously discussed. Works absolutely fine with the play model though. I actually think it works better than I expected with the play model, let's just say. So let's tuck that away. And then we get into actually folding the cockpit down. Now, as I mentioned before, it's gonna move this back a little bit. Very, very, very important that we, uh, that we disconnect our connections to our wheelbase before we try to fold this down, simply because we do not want the weight of the wheelbase resting on those connections. You absolutely will damage the connections in the back of your wheelbase, which would be a bad time. So let me just quickly demonstrate here what happens if you try to just fold the wheel deck down without adjusting the pedal position first. Now, again, this will depend on the pedals that you're using and your height. In terms of the way you have to set the cockpit up ergonomically, obviously everybody's gonna be a little bit different, but if we try to fold this down now, we'll loosen these guys off. And then we'll pop the wheel off too. I should have done that first actually. There we go, <laughs> you can see how, uh, how sketchy it can be if you don't do things in the correct order. So we'll lift this up now to release it from its little catch. And that should, come on, get it out. It's just a bit of a pain to get out of these little grooves initially, but there we go. And it slides down. 
and now it's going to fold away and you'll see there the wheelbase is touching the back of the pedal and it's sitting too high to be able to get the top on the whole thing. So we're going to pop that back up for now. Quickly just get it locked in a position where it's not going to run away from us. So what we need to do is then loosen off our pedals. And what that means is that we're going to have to make sure we get our pedals in exactly the same position every time we want to drive. Otherwise our mu muscle memory is going to be impacted. So again, as I was saying before with the play model, a little bit fidgety to get in here and loosen these off. But once you've done that, you can get it clicked out, slide the pedals back, lock them off again so they're out of the way. And then loosen this guy off again. And we should whoop, do this one too. It then tucks away nicely like so. I did unplug those, didn't I? Yeah, I did. I talked about it. I couldn't remember if I actually did it. <laughs> Lock these off again just so things don't move around if somebody decides to flip this thing on its side. And then we grab the top. Remembering again, there is a wooden top version available for the uh, Go model. There we go. Pops in like so and you are all ready to tuck it away. So the process with the play model and the living model is exactly the same. Just the one thing to consider here is the additional weight. So the steel that they're using here is a lot thicker. It does make the whole assembly a lot heavier as you saw when I was lifting it up. So you just need to be very careful when you fold it away. Likewise, you will, depending on the pedals, need to move the pedals out of the way as well to make sure that your wheelbase can fold completely flat. But now you've got an idea of what it's actually like to live with one of these things from day to day in terms of setting it up and packing it down for driving. Let's talk about what it's actually like to mount the hardware and actually get one of these assembled out of the box. Okay, so what do you need to know about actually assembling one of these things and getting your hardware into it? Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you're buying the Go, you will have to assemble that yourself. It takes about an hour. With the Play version, if you're buying it in the US, they ship it uh, pre-assembled. If you're buying it in Europe, yeah, it does require assembly. So our version of the Play came pre-assembled but look, we did go through the process of building up the Go version, which is essentially pretty much exactly the same as this for all intents and purposes. And look, the, the assembly process is very straightforward. They give you an instruction manual that's got very clear and easy to follow, both written and uh, picture form instructions. I had absolutely no dramas putting the thing together whatsoever. Look, honestly, when I took the, when I took the Go out of the box, saw how many parts there were, I was like, oh gosh, here we go. But it was honestly very, very simple and straightforward. I'm not fantastic at putting this together like that. I'm the sort of person that will usually end up throwing an Ikea shelf across the room three times before it actually gets built. But I didn't get frustrated at all building this thing, which is probably the best test. So it all just bolts together. The side panels go on. Very, very straightforward. Now, mounting the hardware into these is a little bit more cumbersome and a little bit more frustrating simply because, you know, obviously this is a, this is a modular type system that is designed to all just bolt together. But when it comes to the sim racing hardware, they can't account for every single piece of sim racing hardware that's out there. So there's gonna be some little tips and traps and bits and pieces that uh, can contribute to it either being a smooth process or a, uh, a more convoluted process. So let's start off talking about the wheel deck. Now this was straightforward, we didn't run into any issues there whatsoever. There is a compatibility list within their instruction manuals and on their website, a little bit more detail on their website. It does say it's compatible with the Fanatec CSL DD, which obviously also includes the GT DD Pro. The uh, DD Plus that we have here and the uh, CSD DD, of course, do use the exact same mounting pattern as the CSL DD and GT DD Pro. So that was absolutely no issue either. It also lists the Thrustmaster T300, Thrustmaster T150 and Camus C5 as being compatible. And then it also notes the Logitech G series, so G923, uh, G25, G27, G29, G320. No idea what the G320 is, to be honest with you. Uh, and then the Thrustmaster T248. Now we did also test with the new Logitech G Pro or newish Logitech G Pro, uh, and that wasn't an issue either. You'll see that later on when we get over onto the uh, the living version. But look, in terms of the in terms of the wheel plate, very straightforward. This is a spare one that they sent us through from the living, but it's exactly the same as what we have here. In the case of the Go, it's exactly the same bolt pattern again, just a thinner material. So standard. Uh, mounting patterns here for your Thrustmaster, your Logitech, and your Fanatec. So none of those were an issue at all. Just one thing to note with regards to the Logitech G Pro, it does only line up with the two rear holes, these guys here. So uh, you will have to still use the uh, the table clamp, but it doesn't seem to interfere with your legs, uh, at least in my case anyway. I'm six foot tall and it didn't cause a problem for me at all. So that is the wheel plate, very straightforward. The pedal plates uh, starts to get a little bit more complex. Now, 
Obviously, they can't account for every single pedal set that is out there, but we tested it uh, with uh, a couple of different options. So the Logitech G Pro pedals, uh, the Fanatec CSL pedals, which are on the Go, which you saw earlier, and the CSL Elite pedals. Now, we already kind of looked at the Go in a bit of detail, so you probably already got a bit of an idea of what I'm gonna say here. But basically, this is this is what the pedal plate looks like. And again, it, it is exactly the same design between the, uh, the Go and the play and living. This is the plate out of the living. The only difference being that the Go is a thinner material once again with a little bit more flex, which we'll talk about later on. So you've got your standard channels here for mounting standalone pedals. So your Husingvelt pedals, all those kinds of things will bolt on here relatively easily. You may just find, depending on the pedal set, you may have to drill a couple of additional holes just if these channels don't line up with the particular pedals that you have. Likewise, the Logitech G Pro pedal is not too much an issue. It was only uh, compatible with one row of screws, but what we did is we, we mounted the screws towards the front of the pedals. And then obviously when you push down on the pedals, they push into the back of the plate anyway. So it didn't really seem to impact flex or performance really in any way whatsoever, which was absolutely fine. CSL pedals weren't a problem either, but the CSL Elite pedals were a little bit tricky to mount. So come in a little bit closer and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about here. So the CSL Elite pedals, these are the V2s here, but the V1s are exactly the same footprint. So they are quite a wide pedal set and that creates a couple of issues here. So the mounting points on these are quite difficult to access. On the V1 pedals that didn't have these little uh, holes to get a Allen key through, it would have been really, really tricky. But what you basically do is you remove, you remove the pedal plate. And what we ended up having to do was mount the two front fixing points through this channel here. So what we found is if we move the plate all the way forward, it would hit this front lip here. And then the holes wouldn't line up with these channels, but then the holes at the back didn't line up either. So this seemed to be the best compromise overall, uh, having it mounted in the front and then having the back just kind of resting up against the plate. Now there's no fixing point for the back of the pedals here at all. You can see the holes are actually sitting clear of the tray, but because the majority of the force on the brake is kind of going through this part around here, it does push up against the metal here and it does appear to be fine. Now there is a bit of flex and a bit of dip, but look, it, it's perfectly what I would say acceptable, but these pedals were definitely the more challenging pedals to mount. Now the other challenge as well is just getting everything to line up. As I mentioned before, these little levers need to be released and uh, you know you need to be able to lock them down again in position. Now, obviously, if you've got these pedals sitting further forward on the tray, so like if you flip it upside down to allow the um, to allow the rails at the front to sort of line up, then um, what happens is you can't actually open up these these levers, which means then you can't adjust the position because you can't loosen them off or tighten them. So, it's again, it's it's a game of trade-offs here. And dropping this in isn't really too much of an issue. What you do is you just kind of drop it out the front and then slide it back into position and bolt it back into the frame with the four fixing points below. So look, to be completely honest with you guys, it, it, took me, it took me an hour to build the Go completely from scratch from the parts that came in the box. It took me almost three hours to actually get my hardware mounted inside this guy, simply because I was taking my time, I was experimenting, trying to figure out you know, which pedal sets would actually fit, what was the best way to mount it with the least amount of compromise in terms of flex and rigidity, adjustability, all those things. So. Look, I mean, once, once I figured it out, it was maybe a 10 minute job to actually mount everything in here. But that initial kind of learning curve and trying to figure it all out was a little bit, uh, a little bit tricky and a little bit frustrating. I did swear at it a few times. So uh, look, just, just be prepared for that if you are buying one of these. Uh, again, it's gonna, depend on the, it's, it's gonna depend on the hardware that you're mounting in it. But as long as you're aware of that, I don't really see it as a, a point of complaint it's just something to be aware of. Now, one other thing that I do want to talk about quickly while we're here is cable management. They've done a really good job of, you know, providing little tabs and bits and pieces that allow you to route the cables appropriately through the rig. Um, they actually also include with the living and the play versions, this uh, braided sleeve as well, which you can use to keep all your cables together. Now, what that basically does is you squish it up, you can pass your cables through it, and then uh, you can run it down the rig. Now you can see here, it all ended up fraying. Uh, that was because I was trying to put the uh, power supply for the CSDD and DD Plus through it, which is actually the same cable thickness as what's uh, on the boost kit for the CSL DD and GT DD Pro in case you're wondering. So if you have those, it is a little bit thick to fit through this and you're probably better off not using it so you don't end up fraying it like I did, but not really an issue. They provide little tabs right around the perimeter here, that's, and, and as well as some cable ties in the box as well that allow you to just run the cables around. Uh, one thing I would say just to be aware of is make sure you have a nice loop in the cable down here to allow it to fold so it's not pinching and tugging on the cables. 
One thing I would like to have seen is some rubber stripping or something just to protect the cables against the uh, hard metal surfaces. The edges aren't sharp, but you know, when you're moving it in and out, unplugging and replugging, as we talked about earlier as well, there is the opportunity for you know, repeat, repeated rubbing in certain areas, particularly with the vibrations that we get through these wheelbases. So I would like to see some rubber stripping maybe along here, along the tabs that they provide. And also in the, uh, in the little tray for the power supply. I would really like to see them include some rubber stripping just around the thresholds of the power supply just to avoid any cable rubbing over time. I think for the price, there's really no excuse for that. You should never be passing cables through uh, bare metal or painted metal. It should always have some sort of a grommet. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's dangerous by any means, but you could, you could end up shorting a cable out. So, you know, that is one little area of improvement, definitely. You'll also notice that the little box for the power supply is very, very close to the clutch on the CSL Elite 2. That is one point of interference for me. My foot rubs up against that. You can move the location of the pedals, but then they end up being too, too close together to drive properly. So you can remove that if you don't want to use it. In the case of the DD1, DD2, CSDD and DD+, the power supply that comes with those is actually too big to fit in there anyway. So we ended up just kind of tucking it in behind the pedals or you know tucking it down on the floor underneath when we were driving. With the CSL DD GT DD Pro, the standard power supply for five Newton meter and the uh, boost kit do fit in that uh, receptacle. And that's the same across the go, the play and the living. Uh, the Logitech G Pro wasn't an issue either. The power supply fit in there absolutely fine. So clever design, tucks it out of the way. And you know, it is nice and clean in terms of cable management. You just do need to make absolutely sure that uh, A, you unplug the cables in the back of your base before you fold it down just in case they were to become damaged or snagged somewhere and also just make sure you allow enough slack in the cable so that it can bend without putting ex excess strain or bending those cables beyond their uh, correct bend radius. So let's get in now and talk a little bit more about the driving experience overall, flexibility, rigidity, all those important things. And then we'll jump upstairs into the living room again and take the living for a spin on the couch. So let's start off with the experience using the Go. Now this really varied quite greatly depending on the usage case, the environment that you're using it in. So in a living room environment like what you see here with a relatively low slung couch, uh, roughly level with the front of the rig if that makes sense. Uh, really no issues at all ergonomically. The only issue I did have was my, uh, my calf actually rubbing up against that little metal tab that we looked at earlier that allows you to fix your seat in an office environment to the rig. So that was one little issue that I had, but otherwise wheel deck, I was able to get into a good position both in terms of angle and height, again, with a relatively low slung couch and pedal position was relatively okay as well. Maybe a little bit low. And that is one thing that I have told me they will be changing across all three models is the ability to actually raise the pedals up rather than just slide them forward and back and angle them up and down at the rear. So that will definitely be a good uh, addition to all three rigs, I think. But yeah, for me on the couch that I have here, no issues really at all in terms of ergonomics. And I have to say in terms of rigidity as well, although it is noticeably more flexy than what you have with both the uh, both the Play and the living models, I didn't perceive any flex while driving. I was running the GTDD Pro that you see here at the full eight Newton meters of torque with the boost kit. And yeah, I felt like it was absolutely fine. The load cell pedals that we were running here were absolutely fine as well. I didn't feel any excessive flex. You guys can see on the footage here how much things are moving around for yourselves. But in terms of what I was actually feeling as a driver, I wasn't perceiving any noticeable flex whatsoever. But then when we get into an office environment, that's where things get a little bit more complicated. So setting this up at a desk with an office chair, I just struggled to get it into a position that was comfortable for me. I found that the chair was always too high and that was again using a chair that they actually recommended for their rigs. So I wasn't able to get the chair low enough and you can see here, it's just kind of awkward. The wheel deck's just sitting that little bit too low for me. Well, quite a lot too low actually. And because of the compromises here, I was left feeling like, honestly, I would rather just buy a more sturdy desk, fix my wheelbase to the desk itself, and then have some sort of way of fixing my chair to my pedals so they're not moving around. Now, of course, your opinion on that may be completely different. And if you own one of these, please do comment below and let us know what your experience is like. But for me, yeah, I just found it awkward in an office environment, but absolutely fine in a living room environment. So that brings us across now to the play model. Kind of similar feelings here. I feel like the problems that this solves is more kind of with regards to rigidity and the ergonomics of this one are better for a taller person as well. So this, I think I could probably justify to myself a little bit more because it is so much more rigid. Uh, you know, you can run a much, much, much stronger wheelbase on this as well, up to 20 Newton meters in fact. And that's not really something that I would recommend doing on the majority of tables. They're just gonna vibrate and move around too much. And you know, those kinds of torque levels, what ends up happening is even if you've got a solid table, 
the torque starts to you know make your monitor bounce around make things move on your desk and it's just not a good experience overall whereas at the weaker force feedback levels like five to eight newton meters not quite so much of an issue although it can still be a consideration of course so for this guy what i would say is you know for the benefits that you get in terms of rigidity and ergonomics compared to a desk environment it is for me at least worth the effort of you know wheeling it out folding it all out getting it into position and packing it away again when I'm done, but it definitely is far and away a better experience overall than any other folding style cockpit that we've ever tested. Not even in the same ballpark. This is much more similar in terms of the driving experience of what you would get from a conventional aluminum profile cockpit, for example, than a folding style cockpit. So absolutely brilliant if you're after something that some, um, you know, if you're after exactly what it achieves, then it, it's a fantastic product. But if it did have the space for an aluminum cockpit, then of course I wouldn't be buying this, I'd be buying an aluminium cockpit. So it really just comes down to that trade-off. If it's this or nothing, then this is a great option. If you've got the flexibility for a conventional style cockpit, then I think that that is probably the better way to go overall. So I think what it boils down to for me is the living has a very clear purpose for me. I can totally understand and appreciate why somebody would want to buy that to have in their living room, have it not take up space when it's not being used, because these are gonna probably end up being tucked away somewhere anyway, rather than just becoming a part of the environment like the living does. They're a little bit more difficult to justify their existence to me, at least in my particular situation. So let me know what you guys think in the comments, of course. You may completely disagree with me. And if you do own one of these two, let us know what your experience is like. But yeah, I find it more difficult to justify the existence of these because their purpose just seems a little bit less obvious to me than is the case with the living. But let's duck upstairs now and let's take a more detailed look at what it's like to live with the living. Okay, so let's talk now about the experience with the Coffee Racer Living. Now, the fact that it folds out and it provides such a rigid driving experience overall, I think is fantastic. So, you know, driving it, you do notice a little bit of movement in a setup like what we have here. Obviously we're on a couch and everybody's experience is gonna vary there. If you've got really soft cushions, it's gonna be a lot worse than what you're seeing in the footage here. If you've got something that's stiffer, then obviously it's not gonna look as bad as what it does here. What I can tell you from the driving experience is that the force feedback, and I specifically chose this wheelbase because it comes in at close to the, uh, the torque level that this is designed for. Plus it has that true force uh, force feedback technology that gives you a lot more granular detail through the force feedback. So I was really wanting to sort of see how much of that is translated through my hands, how much of it is kind of lost through the carpet and the damping that that provides. And one of the cool things about it was that the, um, because there is a little bit of movement here, how it kind of sits on the carpet. And obviously that'll vary depending on your setup as well, whether you've got a hard floor or carpet like we have here. But what I found was that the vibration from the steering wheel actually kind of transferred through the entire rig. So you actually do feel it in your feet as well, which is quite cool. So it does kind of give the sensation of being, I guess, encapsulated inside a, the cabin of a car to an extent. So it is, it is quite immersive overall. That sounds a little bit silly, I know, but you do kind of feel like you're sitting in something rather than on top of something, if that makes sense. So that whole part of the experience is quite cool. Again, ergonomically, there are some challenges. I'm very lucky that in this particular case, my couch sort of ended up being exactly the right height for what this is. Again, I do have this set to the absolute maximum height. If my couch was any taller than this, I'd be in trouble. Uh, similarly as well, this particular wheelbase does have an angle on it by default. We can't tip the, uh, we can't really tip the wheelbase back far enough to allow for the angle uh, if we were to mount a wheelbase that sits flush, like a, uh, like a CSL DD or GT DD Pro, for example. So that may become a scenario where that uh, Fanatec side mount that was mentioned earlier in the video, which unfortunately we don't have here, so we can't test, but that may be a usage case for that. I just can't tell you because I physically don't have it here and I can't vouch for it. So the one issue that I did have ergonomically, which of course is gonna vary completely depending on the chair that you're using this with, is that the pedals do sit a little bit low for me. now. Again, the pedals that you're using will, will factor into this as well, but there's no way to actually raise the entire platform up. You can only adjust the angle. This is the case for all three models. Uh, it would be great if there was like a second rail that you could install it in to actually lift the height of the pedals up entirely. What I found is after about 10, 15 minutes of driving, again, using load cell pedals here, so you know putting quite a bit of force in, 
Um, I was starting to get some pains in my knee just because the pedals were a little bit too low. Pushing them further away did help, but you know, it's, it's more how low they were compared to the seat of the pants position. When you're, when you're braking, you wanna be kind of pushing with your, particularly with load cell pedals, you wanna be pushing with your thigh primarily, not pushing the pedal with your ankle. And I think that's probably where the problem was for me. I was having to operate the, operate the pedal and put the force in with my ankle rather than my thigh, which isn't really ideal. But look, for what it is, I think it does do a very good job. It's actually a lot more rigid overall, and the driving experience is better overall than I expected that it might be, just given all the, all the considerations and all the variables involved. The challenge for me is how much it costs, honestly. It is a very, very expensive piece of equipment. And while I can appreciate the attention to detail, the quality, and the, the workmanship in what we have here, physically it presents as a very nice high-end and quality piece of equipment. When you look at the alternatives that are on the market, provided that you don't need that ability to integrate it into the space, if you, if you do have the opportunity to just tuck something away in a corner or fold it down, I personally would have a hard time justifying paying this much money for, for this, simply because there are other options on the market that cost a lot less. And I think back to my, my first sim rig was actually a Logitech G27 with a uh, what was called a wheel stand pro. And those are still available now. I'll put us a picture on the screen for you now. But I think that cost me about, I wanna say about 150 Australian dollars back then. So I'm not sure how much that cost now. I'll put it up on the screen for you guys as well. But look, I mean, that, that wasn't gonna handle a direct drive wheelbase, uh, maybe like a five Newton meter or something like that, but it wasn't gonna handle anything like this guy. It wasn't gonna handle load cell pedals. It did tend to sort of slide across the floor and you know, it, it, was a, it was a challenge to use compared to something like this, but for the money, it provided a really fun experience. And I spent hours and hours and hours playing Gran Turismo 5, I think it was, um, on the PS3 with that thing. And I loved it, I enjoyed it, and I didn't really feel any need to upgrade from it. So I think you kind of have to put all this stuff in perspective. If you've got the money and you can afford you know, the real high-end gear and you wanna have something that you can use with that high-end gear, but also integrate into your living space, then yeah, maybe it makes sense to you, maybe you can justify the price. But look, when I compare it to other options that are available on the market, even the, even the next level racing wheel stand pro that we looked at a number of years ago. So that again, isn't something that you can really fold and stash away out of sight, out of mind. But people will probably spend the extra money to buy something that they can fold away and then find that in the real world, they just don't end up bothering doing so and it ends up being set up all the time. And in, in, that, in that scenario, I can't help but feel like you would have been better off just buying something that was cheaper, provides almost the same level of rigidity, but uh, you know just doesn't have that ability to fold away. So for me, what it boils down to is this. I think all three products are very good. I think they're very well built. I think they're very well thought out and very well designed. What they're trying to achieve with these products is very difficult. And in doing so, there's always gonna be some compromise. You're always gonna have you know limited amount of adjustment, limited amount of you know rigidity, it's just a very, very, very difficult thing to achieve. And I think given, given that fact, they've done a very, very good job with all three of these products. So, you know, I don't, I don't really have any major complaints overall. There are a few little things that I think they can definitely improve on as we've uh, kind of touched on in the video. But overall, I think they've done a very good job. I think really it's just gonna be up to you guys to decide whether in the real world, you're actually gonna fold something away every time you use it, whether you're actually gonna be taking advantage of, I guess, the benefit that they're marketing with these things. For me, Honestly, I'm too lazy to fold something away all the time. I do things quickly. You know, I'm thinking about my kids as well. They're gonna jump in, they're gonna drive, they're gonna get called for dinner. And they're not gonna be strong enough to pack this away anyway. They're gonna need me or, uh, or Jill to help them do it anyway. And it's just, it's just not gonna happen realistically. But if, you, you know, if you're living in a small apartment with your, with your partner and you like to keep things tidy, things have to be tidy because it's a small space, maybe you'll have the motivation to do it and maybe it'll be absolutely perfect for you. And I think if you're, if you're that particular customer, then I don't think you're gonna be disappointed. I think you just need to be aware of the, uh, aware of the limitations, aware of some of the challenges that you might face. And uh, yeah, I think as long as, as long as you fit right into that mold, it's a very, very good product. I don't really have any reason to not recommend it. I just think for the price, you really need to think long and hard about whether the cost is justified in what you're trying to achieve. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave this set up for a while and uh, you know, let my kids use it and just see how it integrates into daily life and maybe do a follow-up video in a couple of months time or a post and let you guys know. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's all just my subjective opinion. That's all just you know, how I kind of put myself into the situation. You might be completely different, but at the end of the day, they're all good quality products. They're well built, they're well presented. If they were half the price, I think my attitude towards them would be quite different, but they are very expensive. I mean, in the case of the living, you know, to put it in perspective, you're paying 
around about the same for this as you'd be paying for a full on, you know, aluminium profile cockpit with, you know, all sorts of bits and pieces added to it for mounts and whatnot. And, you know, you do need to think really long and hard about whether the money is well spent, invested into something like this, whether you're ultimately likely to end up with something like that anyway. So I think that pretty much sums it up, guys. Hopefully we've given you enough information that you feel better informed and better able to make a, uh, a good decision for your own personal circumstances. And it's as simple as that, guys. So thank you very much for watching and uh, we'll see you again very soon. Bye.